All right, looks like we've got a pretty good chunk of people here. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Again, I'm Kevin White with Outhouse. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the feasibility, the pros, the cons, the fears, the pluses, the minuses of buy it now on websites. Is it even something that home builders want or is it something we're being pushed toward? Uh, and today we have three industry experts. Uh, we have Chip Johnson. He's the president of Builder Designs. We also have Dennis O'Neill. He's the president of O'Neill Interactive. And then of course, Greg Bray, he's the co-owner of Blue Tangerine. Gentlemen, what say you? Hello, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I, can we, can, can the, I think everybody can kind of tell that you guys are all website experts because normally if I'm throwing that, I'm like, what's up, everybody? And I go into full radio voice. Mm -hmm. You guys are just like, yes, hello, how are you? Um, can we do radio voice, Kevin? We, we can do radio voice. Today, we can do today, radio today voice. <laughs> today, 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 website, website, website. So what are we here for today? We're here because every return somewhere in the industry Everywhere in the industry, somebody is telling you that we need to buy a now button. We need to buy a now button. But who's actually pushing that, that narrative? Uh, do we need to buy a now button? What is our definition of buy now? Is it a fully assist or fully uh, self service or is it assisted? Is it somewhere in between? Who has the responsibilities? What are the functions? What are the limitations? Uh, what are some of our fears? I mean, know that I know that some salespeople are like, hey, if there's a buy it now button, do I need to start worrying about my job? <laughs> You know, and then there's there's going to be some acronyms we're going to use like API and interface and data data migration, data management, cross pollination, and there's some scary stuff like PCI compliance. All these terms and all this stuff can be uncovered with all three of these gentlemen. So let's take a deep dive into the nerdy collective we have here of these three experts, and we'll just see get started on it. So I guess let's go ahead and start off and, and we're gonna kind of go more of an at-large uh, uh, format, but in this case, I do wanna hear from everybody. And I'll start with, uh, we'll go Dennis, Greg, Chip in this case. Uh, I'd like to know kind of what is your definition of buy it now? What, what do you see buy it now, Dennis? So I'd say probably the most challenging part of defining buy it now is that most every builder has a, def a different definition of buy it now, right? So I, I think, you know, we'll see probably a lot of agreement here in the panel, but the, the buy it now really is defined by what problem is the builder trying to solve? You know, there's, there's a lot of buzz around the idea of being able to enable buy online, you know, but some builders, you know, might have a challenge with, with in the entire process, right? From shopping to option selections, to design center, all the way to loan application, to checkout, to earnest money. You're going to have different laws that vary state to state in terms of how earnest money can be collected and how that's going to be handled. You've got builders that do custom options that aren't really available from a, you know, an interactive floor plan, you know, I mean, so like those are the kind of things that make it challenging. Um, you know, I'd say that internally, our definition of buy it now can be anything from enabling the reservation, you know, like actually collecting some kind of money. I think that's, the, that's really sort of the, the, the line where it crosses from just sort of enabling shopping online to actually enabling a commitment. And then really it just becomes a question of how much of a commitment do we want people to be able to make? But I, I think you need, I think you need the exchange of dollars to actually make it a buy it now experience. Craig, where are you on that? So I, I mean, I, I agree with Dennis that, that there's probably going to be a lot of uh, agreement here. The, the heart of it is, is it's whatever you want it to be at some point, you know, um, and, and what works for you, as long as we're not trying to trick the consumer somehow by, by any type of bait and switch where we imply one type of process that really isn't what's there, you know, so we got to be careful that when we use these terms, we use them in a way that is consistent with what a buyer is going to be expecting. You know, if, if we say buy it now and it's just reserve a lot and there's no money, that's a little bit of a disconnect for me in, in that term buy, right? Buy it now. It's mine. I've bought it, right? If it's just holding it for a period of time or something there, there's a disconnect. So I think we want to avoid the disconnect um, with the consumer, make sure that we are communicating clearly what it is they're going to get when they go through whatever process it is that we're, that we're talking about. Chip. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the, the buy it now, um, discussion of buy it now it's really it, it's kind of um i've kind of landed on it's anything that can 
can compress the sales cycle and provide a, a better buying experience. Um, one of the things that, that, that we hear about all the time is you got buyer apathy because everybody is tired of competing. Um, you know, you've got 10 people lining up to buy a house. Now that may not be the case here in the next year, but it has been. And so if you can go in and you can click a button that is going to start the sales process. Now, whatever that means, I, I do agree that there needs to be a, a, an e-commerce transaction where you're taking money, you're going to start the process, that kind of thing. Um, that's to me, that's all buy it now can really be right now. Um, I've talked to builders that want to, they want to automate the whole thing. And I just don't think that we're there yet. Um, I still think that the, the, the key question for me is how do you incorporate the human, you know, connection with technology? Because I still think that there needs to be a phone call. There needs to be some finessing to really create an experience that is a positive one. I think it's more than, I mean, the, it's more than just a button click here by now. I think you've got to, you got to explain it. You've got to talk about it. You've got to provide questions and the feedback that I get from people that have gone through that experience is they may even call in and talk about some things before they go back and actually click the button to buy now. So I think you got to keep all those things in mind when you're considering, you know, rolling out a, a buy it now scenario on your website. Chip, can we continue on that? Because uh, there's two factors I'm going to talk about really quickly. One is the old codgers. I'm the guy that doesn't use self-checkout in a grocery store because they don't pay me to do it. Until they start paying me to, to ring up my own groceries, I'm not going to do it. But what do you say to those people that don't want to drive through that process? What do you say to the builders that are like, oh, well, we need to make this automated? So that's factor number one. And the other factor is, do we need to worry about commoditization of our product lines? You know, yes, you're buying land in a certain dirt near a certain school district or near work, but it still comes down to you still have competitors and not necessarily against other new home builders, sometimes just existing homes. But what would you say to, uh, you've, you've already alluded to it, but what do you say about the level of personality that it still needs to be infused into the equation? And then two, about the, the factor of, um, of, a, of a commoditizing your product line. Yeah. Well, and, and that's a great point because, you know, I feel like uh, just because of supply chain issues, we are turning homes into a commodity where you're not customizing anything. It's kind of like, here it is. We've already selected the paint, the color, and everything. So if you've got that scenario, then we really can't expect the buyer to come in and want to dive into the deep end and learn about what goes into this home and all the things that we can customize. If none of that's happening, so we're commoditizing a process. And so I think that's one thing to, to look at but, you know, I, I don't think that um, buy it now is the only way. In fact, it, it's, it's in addition to, I, I still think that you've got the other channels that are already there um, that have been there, that have been pr proven to work well. Those are still there. Um, buy it now is for those that prefer to, to do that. And it may be, you know, the data is still limited. I know from, from my standpoint, the builders that, that I'm working with, we're still looking at a data set that isn't huge. So can we say, here's the conversion rate of here's, you know, if you're selling hundred homes, 20 are gonna use buy it now. We, I don't have that data, not yet. Um, we, I have small data and I can say it's working, but I don't think that you wanna have that be the only way to buy a home. I, I just do not think that that's, that's um, and I know there's builders that I've talked to that disagree. They, they only want, a buy now scenario. They don't want salespeople involved. And, and to that, I go, well, let's see how that goes. Because I still think the human, you know, component is, is very important. Dennis? Yeah, I'm going to have to agree that the human component is um, important. And, and, and the, the thing I think when you're, Kevin, your question about commoditization is, is something that's going to take me back to, um, so I started in the industry as a new home salesperson. So I'm going to cite Tom Ritchie, if any of you guys remember that name from way back when. Uh, so Tom Ritchie used to talk about building the one of a kind, you know, like narrowing it down with the buyer and identifying that this home site and this home and these options and this scenario, this particular package is one of a kind. And I don't know that the whole entire buy online process really gives us the ability to do that. It absolutely does have some sort of commoditization angles to it. 
And I think that the market where we are today in a lot of places supports the ability for us to do that, right? Supports the ability for us to be able to sort of turn it into an entire cart process. But I don't know that the markets of tomorrow are going to support that the same way. So if, if we go to a standpoint, to your point, Kevin, where you're all in and you only offer one option to do this, it might work for today's market. But I don't know that if it's going to really provide the flexibility to support the buyer who's comfortable doing that and later the buyer who's not comfortable doing that. So this is kind of related, but Greg, what are your thoughts on sales teams? Do they need to be worried that if we implement, if we take this ideal, this utopian society where we can make everything just a click a button and you, you can drop in your cart and move right on in. If this happens, do salespeople need to be worried? Well, they need to be worried if they think they're just going to keep doing the same thing that they're doing now. You know, in, in that in that case, they need to be worried, right? Their their role will change. I, I go back to kind of the the beginnings of online travel and uh, and what it did to travel agents, right? Tra the travel agent industry changed dramatically back in the in the late '90s, early 2000s, right? Um, I mean, with Expedia and then airlines getting their own websites and, and all these kinds of things changed dramatically. But are travel agents gone? No, they're not gone. But what they do today is different. And the number of them that they're out there is probably very different too. Um, but I think that that role does change dramatically. It changes from one of, of being more of a coach and a guide, even more so. I mean, it always should have been that, you know, as opposed to trying to really push a particular thing at somebody. But now, because of the amount of knowledge and information they can have, because hopefully they can do some of the process at home on their computer, you know, and, and not need all the handholding the same way, but they will still need some because it's a big purchase. It's a big deal to buy a house. It, it is something that most of us don't do very often, you know, and, and we aren't very comfortable with it. And we, we want just that confidence of somebody saying, yeah, you're doing it right. You're not making a mistake, you know, because we're, we're terrified of making mistakes, especially with big dollars at stake. Well, to your point, Greg, it's also a high transaction cost. Right. So it's not like something you can just easily, oh, I'm just going to take this yeah. back. to. The I'm going to return it tomorrow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you can't do that. Right? The closing costs, you know, all that stuff is gone. So it's it's a high transaction fee. Now, now maybe that maybe that's a piece to it. If we can add return your home after 30 days, um, then, then, then then we open up. Satisfaction guarantee. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, so, and I think that's the thing that that goes back to the whole the data piece of if you sold 10 homes, how many people click the button? put in their credit card, put it, put a deposit down, and then went to contract and went and, and closed the deal. What that number is compared to the people that got into it and decided, well, you know what, I guess I didn't really want that and refund my money. And then the house goes back to being available. I mean, that, that that's part of what we all together are, are learning what that looks like. And you absolutely need to have the ability to, you know, pick up the phone, call the person, talk to them. And if it's not what they thought, you click a button, refund it, automatically goes back and, and you, everybody moves on. That, that has to be part of the scenario. The financial bounce rate. I love it. That would be an financial interesting bounce uh, rate. metric. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. this kind of paints, a, it paints a, a, an odd equation. So I'm going to paint a picture. It's a lot easier at, at IBS where we actually got a part, uh, audience participation. But uh, let's just take Ford, Ford automobiles, for example. Every Ford, when Ford decides they want to implement a buy it now or a finance this vehicle button, they're the finance company. They're the people that create all the website content for every dealer. So if you're a dealer in Podunk, you know, Mississippi, uh, guess what? You still have to buy into the same website and the same assets and the attributions that, uh, that Ford makes you follow as a dealer. So in the home building industry, we don't, have, we don't have that luxury because how many different CRMs do we use? And even with all those different CRMs, how many of us use them in the same exact way? We don't. You know, I guarantee if we had a lasso expert on here, they could tell us that, you know, they have out of 10 different clients, all 10 of those use that platform in a slightly different way or even in radically different ways. Yes. Um, so now let's tie that into not just a CRM, but an ERP even if you have an ERP, uh, into your contracting systems, into your mortgage, you know, who's approving mortgages and how many different uh, channels you have there. Uh, how are you getting your documents signed? So the, paint, the picture I'd like to paint with that is that you understand that the auto industry, because people always like to say, well, the auto industry does this, we should do this. They have an easier pathway because every dealer in their network 
is afforded and gets and has to buy into the same system. So how do we navigate this world where all this cross compatibility isn't cross compatibility? You know, what you, what you develop, what Dennis, what you would have developed for a website um, that would interface with uh, Mark systems, for example, uh, won't work for a builder that uses builder trends. How do you, how would you address that for that cross compatibility? So I think it, it goes back to mostly, I feel like what, what is the, the builder, what is the builder looking to solve, right? So like if, if we say that the, you know, the builder believes that they want to, you know, it's, a, it's an important question to, to ask the motivation behind the buy now, right? And I, and I say this with, with full transparency, I am a proponent of enabling the, at least the very, the beginning part of the purchase process online. So I am pro this technology just as a whole, because I do think that it is something that more and more consumers will expect. And I do think it's, it's part of sort of a, a contemporary purchase experience where you do have the ability to sort of shift your buying attention from in-person to online, um, just, uh, and seamlessly move back and forth. But I will say that there are lots of things that we can do um, as a builder and, and from a builder website to be able to improve the purchase process online. So we have to ask ourselves, are we trying to enable the entire process because we think that's what the buyer wants? Or are we trying to enable a part of the process because we think maybe this is where we get stuck? Or we think maybe that this could go smoother, or maybe that this would open up the ability for more people to more fairly reserve a home site, you know, if we, you know, have people waiting in line the day of a launch, you know, is it fair for the people who can't actually be there? You know, is there accessibility concerns for people who can't actually make it on site? You know, these are the things that we can solve with technology. Um, but do we actually even need to go down the lot of like, well, okay, well, how do we make it so that somebody can price out every single option? Now, I'm a proponent of that because again, just Kevin, as you described, that's what people are used to in the auto industry. Right, and this is where this is where we know that people spend lots and lots and lots of time on builder websites that allow them to actually price out a home. So I think that there's significant benefit there from a sales process. But is is somebody not going to purchase from a builder? And I don't. This is going to sound like I'm not a fan of buy it now, but I don't know that I don't mean to to make it this way. But is somebody not going to purchase from you because they can't do the entire process online, but yet they could from another builder? But if your home is better. If your price is better, if your home sites are better, if your community is better, is somebody going to say, well, I really like this home, but I can buy this one online. So I'm just going to move here instead. I, I don't think that's the kind of place that we have consumers in. I think we might have consumers in a place where this is the home I want. I'd love it if I could do more of this online, yeah. but this is the home I want. So I still think that the process is about selling the home and the community first. So I think builders should ask themselves, is that's what's stopping them from selling more? Is the fact that they don't have the ability to purchase online? And is this the place where they should be focusing their efforts? Or is it all of those other sort of blocking and tackling things that a lot of builders still haven't quite resolved yet, like getting interactive floor plans or getting all their renderings complete or getting their site plans ready or getting their lot availability up to date or getting more videos or more photography. All of those things that have more to do with actually selling the community and the home first. If all those are down pat, then absolutely. Let's talk about the next step. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, Dennis, I, you know, it's funny because I, I have this discussion or I've had this discussion before and it, it, the building industry, and we've all been in this space for a long time. We have a tent, the building industry has, has a tendency when there's something new and shiny, it's like, Ooh, we gotta <laughs> have it. We gotta yeah. have it. And if, and if the guy down the street's got it, I sure as hell have to have it because I, I could be missing out on something. So that's part of what's going on here, mm -hmm. I feel like. Um, and I think that, um, you know, two builders, one has to buy it now, the other one doesn't, they're both going to sell homes. It, it, mm -hmm. By having that, do, that doesn't guarantee you anything. But what it does guarantee you is that if you don't have it, then you know nothing about what the online buying experience could be for your buyer. And I, I'm of the opinion that it's an addition to, and like the builders that, that have done this, that have done it and, and sold homes, I tell them you have an interview, not an interview, but an, like an exit uh, discussion with, tell me what this was like for you. How can we improve? What were the things that made you do this? Like, 
we had a builder and I love stories like this because this was a builder who his leadership team was not on board. They didn't want to do it. This guy wanted to do it. He wanted to try it. And the builder was like, listen, if it doesn't work, we have to turn it off. Okay, great. Within a week, they sold a home. Somebody came in and because they have call rail, we were able to tell, they called in and talked to somebody at the building company, asked about directions to a community, went out, drove around. They had flown in from being out of town and they had a short window of opportunity. And so they went out, looked and drove around before they got on the flight to go home, clicked a button, buy it now, start the sales process. So there's an example of the right product fit for that buyer. Um, I absolutely think that the data that you get from people that prefer that kind of transaction is currency. And, and it's currency from the standpoint of it's important to you, to your team, to what they know. And, and, that, and that leadership team, by the way, that was not really on board, emails are flying back and forth like this is the greatest thing. And so, you know, you just have to kind of keep that in mind that, you know, and the sales team was not happy. They were like, well, you're cutting us out of the deal. And what are we going to do? Well, what they do is they finesse the thing along because it's, there, there is still a role for salespeople to pick up the phone, call, congratulate, you know, you got the automated email, but you still pick up the phone and call okay, I'm going to send you a DocuSign contract and here's the purchase and sale, da, da, da. All that still happens. That's all still in place. Now, that's the process that I recommend. Um, I don't, I, I still think that um, if you try to automate, automate too much of that, for example, let's say that you click a button, buy now, put your money down, you get an automated contract, a DocuSign. I'm going to be reluctant to sign that. Like, okay, well, what happens if I sign this you know, what's my back out? If that's a purchase and sale, that's a little bit more binding than, you know what I mean? So I think that there's some coaching there that the salespeople um, are absolutely involved in from beginning to end. And I think that's a customer service piece. So, so can follow, I, Greg, can I follow? Yeah. Go ahead, Greg. I'm sorry. I, I just I just had a personal experience recently that I think highlights some of the, the nuances, though, related to generational um, expectations, you know, mm-hmm. with, with the younger folks. I mean, my, my kids are the ones I'm talking about. So my, my daughter, she's mid twenties. She just had a fender bender. Um, first time she's, and I was like, no, you get to call the insurance company. I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she, she's like, isn't her first question, isn't there something on the website I can do instead of call them? That was the <laughs> first question she, she came to me with. Right. And I'm like, I don't know. At, all that's on the card is the phone number. She calls mm-hmm. the phone number, right? The phone number says to submit a claim, please go to the website and fill out this form, right? That's mm-hmm. that's what the phone number says. So first of all, she's she's already been pushed back and forth. She goes, she fills out the form. Then she starts getting calls from this claims agent. Um, and it takes three days of back and forth phone tag to actually connect, leaving voicemails, everything else. And and she, she gets on afterwards, she goes, all they did was ask me the exact same questions I'd already filled out on the website. Mm-hmm. And I, I even said to them, why did I fill them out on the website if you're just going to ask me all the same questions again? So I, I don't illustrate this as a pro or con to buy online, but I think it shows that we can't just slap something on the website and expect that without understanding the process, that it isn't going to create more frustration if we aren't using the information. Also, the expectation that she had of, well, can't I just start on the website? That I mean, and I don't know if it was just the fear of talking to somebody she didn't want to talk to or whatever, but there is, I think, a generational thing there where they they kind of prefer that to start with at least. And mm-hmm. and so it's hard for me at as as the old guy with gray hair to to completely connect potentially with where some of those buyers may be. I don't think it's everybody, right? Everybody doesn't go through self-checkout, you know, at, at the grocery store. Some people people don't. And sometimes it's about what they're actually purchasing versus not. And then there's times I get in self-checkout and I still need help because, hey, uh, something didn't go quite the way it was supposed to. And I got to sit there and figure out, is there a person who can reset this thing for me so we can get on with it? Well, speaking of reset, because me doing eight years in the Marine Corps, I know all about signing the contract. And once you sign that contract, it's binding and you're, you're in for that haul. That's a, that's a, well, technically the four year plus a four year extension, but that's a different story. Um, but, uh, you know, Chip actually brought up a very valid point that, you know, if you do automate this process, what is that, um, that level of comfort that a consumer would have with 
literally signing a contract for a home, you know, 200, 300, 400, 500,000 dollars that they're on the line for now. Yeah. So can um, I go ahead? I'm sorry, Chip. Well, and the other thing that I forgot to mention, you guys, is that, um, you know, that 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 the that example I was talking about, that was a five hundred and fifty thousand dollar house, um, which I, you know, and, and I've been wrong frequently along this journey of, well, it's got to be standing inventory. And it's, you know, it's first time home buyers, younger people, you know, that that mid price point and 550,000, to me, that's still a lot of money, but now it's like, it's not. But that, you know, that the point that I make there is that, um, and that house was, uh, that particular house was 90 days out from, from closing. So it was a to be, not to be built, but in the process of being built, and this guy wanted to lock it up because he's moving in town. So, you know, again, it goes back to that product fit for that person at that time. It was like, Bam. Now they're not all that way. Um, but I, I think that it's important just to kind of cover all the things that we know here so that we can say, hey, when we go to market, this these are some of the things that, that we can expect. So, Kevin, what was it that you had that you asked before that I jumped in? What was it? Well, there was there was a couple of things, but one was just about the feasibility of somebody back wanting to be able to back out of a contract, you know, that there's a commitment. Is somebody willing to make that plunge? Obviously, they are because, you know, they do it with high dollar cars, too. But um, and then also just the, the fact that, uh, you know, the connectivity aspect of it, you know, how can you connect all these different systems? But, yeah, it's really um, and, and Dennis, I cut you off. So you, you, you uh, it's okay. Yeah. I was, I was going to say that I think, you know, your, your sort of, um, your timeline example, Chip is, I think is, is probably, um, is very much what we see, right? So from the, you know, the standpoint of, you know, obviously there are examples of, you know, people that are willing and have gone through the entire process uh, online, but most of what we're seeing from our builders that have enabled uh, these kind of preliminary exchange of funds, you know, whether or not it's a reservation or a purchase or however their ber verbiage is actually sort of worded, it is a scenario where they have the online purchase is a part of their experience. You know, they have been to the community you know, they, they have made a selection, they have talked to a salesperson. And then as opposed to the current process for a builder who doesn't have an online ability, you know, the, the person or the couple or the family has to sit at the desk and then be positioned to, you know, have the salesperson say, okay, are we ready to buy a home? You know, are, are we ready to make this yours? And there is that sort of like pressure where you get the couple looking at one another yeah, that's not that's not comfortable for everybody. Plus, there might be some other questions they have to answer. So they leave. But now we have a place where people can have that salesperson can still answer ask that question. I do not mean to tell people not to ask that question. But now those individuals can leave, you know, to your point, Chip, they could get on a plane and be on the way home. And you know what, you know what, lot 12 is the one I want. Yeah. And then just make the reservation and lock it up. The couple can go home. The person can go home in the middle of the night. They wake up the next morning. They know the lot release is scheduled for 10 a.m., but they got to work. They can't make it there. So instead, they just go to the website and lock it up with a credit card. Yeah. So we've enabled the ability for people to make a decision outside of the sales office. And, yeah. and I think that it, it, it can work beautifully in combination with the on-site sales experience um, and, and essentially augment uh, the capabilities of the salesperson, but by no means eliminate, um, but oh, augment that. Yeah, it's a tool. It's not the only tool in the toolbox. It's an additional yes. tool. And you know, the thing that I know that I, that um, Kevin, you asked about, uh, how do you incorporate all of the different to, uh, back end components, ERP, CRM, call rail, all these things, inventory mm -hmm. management that's real time and all that stuff, because this all factors into that. Um, and it's not a quick thing. I can just tell you, it's not. And every builder is a little bit different. How they how they coordinate communication is is something that you got to spend time talking about, role playing, um, testing. You know, when I tell builders that, you know, this is not a plug it in and see you later. It's we're selling homes. It it does not work that way. You've got to market it. You've got to have a go-to-market strategy, I feel. You've got to tell people, hey, we have this. Here's what it's solving. Here's what it does for you. Here's the, you know, the value add. The, 
you don't have to worry about competing bids. You can, you know, if, you, if you're ready to go, you can lock it up right now. Um, you know, all of these things, uh, they're good. You've got to tell that story. Um, but when you're communicating, when you've got different backends, you know, we talked about this in our seminar, some builders don't have a CRM. No. Um, you know, how in the hell uh, are you going to uh, track effectiveness for something like this? Like if you don't have call rail, we wouldn't have known that, you know, some of these people are calling in ahead of time and asking a question before they buy. You know, you've got to have some of that stuff lined up. So before you start thinking about, let's just put this button on, it's, it's a silver bullet, you really have to have a planning session about what are the other components that this touches, and it touches a lot more than you think. So that's a big part of it, but it's every one of them is, is pretty custom. And like we had a builder that, that's a WordPress platform. I, we can't, I can't make it work on WordPress, um, you know, and uh, because that platform isn't really designed for the kind of stuff that we're talking about. So, you know, I think that the question is plan to plan, yes. you know, have a meeting about the meeting um, because you're going to want to do more of that than less with your, with your leadership team and then your, your, your partner. At the end of the day, it is really all about what's the business problem we're trying to solve. And, yes. and, and not losing sight of that, um, like Chip mentioned about for the shiny new objects, right? And, and recognizing that this does, the, the putting the stuff on the website is really not the hard part. It's the back office yeah. that's the hard part. It, it's all about the data. It's all about the back and forth. It's all about real-time updates and, and, and things there. And, and it's all doable. I mean, I, I think everybody can say, oh, it's just time, money, and programming, right, guys? I mean, we can, it's, <laughs> so um, we yeah. can, you know, but, but it's not um, a little bit of time, money, and programming. It could be a lot of time, mm -hmm. money, and programming. And so, so it, it's something that requires really a recognition that there may be fundamental business processes that get impacted and have to change to make something like this work. Yeah, exactly. Great. So just so everybody knows, one little bit of housekeeping that I forgot about, horrible host, by the way, um, <laughs> was that if you have any questions, put it in the question and answer. There is a question there right now that I will be answering, that our panelists will be answering very soon. But I want to go into one little bit of a definition because I get this question when I'm selling, you know, can your interactive floor plans talk to the CRM? There's a thing called an API. It's just a translator. And not all APIs function the same way, but what an API basically does is it says this website, these activities that happen here, that creates data fields. And those data fields have to be put into a language that whatever application you're sending it to, whatever other program you're sending it to, that that data transfer happens and it fills in the right buckets and the right uh, tidbits of information, if you will. Name, address, phone number, what plan they're looking at, what lot they're looking at. Um, so what we're talking about with the cross compatibility is that if Dennis creates an API that connects a you know, home affinity to Lasso, mm -hmm. it's not the same exact setup that he would do if he was connecting it to top builder solutions. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's not the best example, but I'm trying to paint a picture that you have to understand that every builder has their own systems and these guys are stuck holding the responsibility of how do I make these different systems talk to each other? And if I spend the money to create this system that will make X talk to Y, it doesn't apply to Z. Now I have to make a whole nother system to connect to Z. Is that is that well, a fair statement, Dennis? To your point, Kevin, just as you mentioned earlier, that if you took 10 builders that use Lasso, each of their implementations are going to be slightly unique, right? right? So even if you have 10 builders that use the same ERP, their options are going to be structured a little bit differently. They might use different fields to manage some things. They might be elevation specific or plan specific. They could use different fields for their ID numbers. Maybe they use a special custom field to manage something unique that they needed to be displayed. So every single implementation is absolutely has to be tailored to the builder's use. So Greg, not to get into specifics of money, but is this, are setting up these APIs, are they free or does somebody pay for this? And if somebody pays for it, who hmm. pays for it? Uh, it's it's obviously not free um, oh. because yeah you know, but but now that we're ready to hire Kevin as a programmer because that explanation was so was so good yeah. Um, yeah. but um, but it, it it does take some work and, but it some of that work is really about how well prepared they are even beforehand right if I mean when Dennis talks about you know mm -hmm. unique 
implementation. Some of them are very unique. It's like, why did you put that in that field? That mm -hmm. is, just doesn't make any sense that you would have the price in the middle of this big, long string of characters, you know, mm -hmm. that, that are all together instead of in its own field by itself, you know, type of a thing, you know. So, so there is some of that that gets in the, the idea of keeping data as data and, and descriptions and things kind of separated out so that you can get at it and use it in different ways um, instead of just clumping everything into one giant description field or comment field or something where everything goes together um, is really makes some of that coding a, a lot easier to do later because you're right, we have to move things back and forth in this kind of scenario between the website and these other systems because there has to be a master controller of the data. What is the price of that home? Somebody has to know that is the price and everybody else has to mirror that. Well, that, You can't have questions. That brings us to an important point and this is, this is going to go into the question that uh, somebody asked. It's anonymous, by the way, but uh, somebody did ask this question. Um, they're asking if this applies, and I can answer this one. Does this apply, the buy it now function, does it apply to build from scratch, dirt? Or are we talking about spec homes? Are we talking about both? And I'm going to just pre-answer for these guys. Yes, yes. no, depends. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your situation? <laughs> um, what are you selling? What are your mm -hmm. problems are you trying to solve? Yada, yada, yada. Chip, what do you got on that? Well, I think you can you can use it as a pre-sell tool. Uh, pre-sell meaning you let's say you get to drywall and you can forecast pricing and you can say, okay, this house is going to be X. Then you can have that be a you can use that in that scenario. Um, it, but that that one is kind of you know I, I, that's not for everybody. Um, margins being what they are right now, you got to be comfortable with a little bit of flexibility. Um, I, you know, I think that standing inventory for sure. Yeah, if you have that, I mean. Um, then that's, you know, a perfect scenario. Um, but I, you know, starting from scratch, I, I haven't done it. So I can't speak to that. I mean, I, I think there's going to come a time where you can say, okay, I want this lot. I want that plan that fits on that lot. And I want to build the house and here's the cost. And, and I think we're going to get there, you know, one of these days, I, I haven't done that. So I don't, I would say because of pricing and timing, and how long is it going to take to build that house? I just don't know how that works right now. It does get into the complexity of pricing, really, is, is a huge part of all of that, right? Both, both right now, pricing is even weirder because it changes so much. But, but pricing has always been complicated because there's so many choices available in, in the whole process, right? I mean, you, we talk about auto industry. What did they do to get rid of that? They locked you down into three or four choices. You get package A, B, or C and pick it, and that's what you get. And they, and they did that to simplify kind of both their production side, but also the pricing pieces. Um, but builders make a lot of money on options, right? I mean, that's, 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 a, that's a huge opportunity for them. So they don't necessarily want to lock somebody in to just a set one where somebody could say, oh, well, I want this too. And they don't want to say no to that, uh, at least a lot of them. I mean, I won't speak for every builder by any means. Um, but, but at some point, we might have to let go of some of that complexity and simplify it if we really want to do the whole thing in, in that, in my opinion. And to your point, Greg, I'd say probably one of the most common websites that people say that they love these days is Tesla. Um, but if anybody ever noticed, you, you, you go to buy a Tesla, you have like six options. Like, that's it. Like, that's you know, it. A, like you, there's not a lot of complexity there. You, you just you pick a package, pick a color and give you want them their the, money. You want the big battery or the regular battery? Right. Yeah. There's only there's there's like three decisions. to make. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously buying a home is a bit more complex than that. I so, mean, no matter how simplified you make it. A little bit of a, a tangent here. This is from Sandy, uh, Sandy Marenberg. Uh, but if hey, Sandy. when we're looking at uh, the online buyer, how do we know uh, to be able to differentiate whether they're bots, Russian spies, or actual potential clients? Now, granted, when you get into the, the fiscal mm -hmm. aspect of it, where they actually have to put money down, different story. But how do we know that they're not just reserving lots for the sake of reserving lots you know, to, to wreak havoc? If there's money tied to it, they're not going to put money down. And I mean, that's easy. Yeah. Like, I don't want to reserve not, anything unless they got yeah, money, right? Yeah, you can't. That, that's, and that's the thing. It's like, it needs to be real money, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks. I've got builders got his, his deposits, $3,000. Um, it really just kind of depends on what you want. But if you're going to put in a debit card um, or ACH transaction, you're, you're a real buyer. That's the, there's the separator. That's an easy one. I, I agree. It should not be $10 to reserve a lot. Right. No. That's, 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 that's too easy. That's too no. easy. It's gotta be enough to make them think twice 
but not so much to make them not do it, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, That's and then the other thing that, that it's worth mentioning, you know, the whole thing on, you know, earnest money and, and all of that, I think that in that, because that comes up a lot, like, well, we can't take a credit card. Credit card can't be used for earnest money. Um, but if you credit that back, you know, at some point, then you can use that money just to throw that out there. So you guys, when you're thinking about, because an ACH transaction, you know, that whole thing, it's almost like somebody hit the, the you know, the, the skids on, you know, you've got to put in your routing number and all that stuff. A lot of people, if you give them that option, yeah, I'd say one out of 10 are going to do that. And it's just easier to take a thousand dollar debit card um, to, to, you know, grease that whole prep, that process through that. That's a recommendation I've seen it work. Well, then you run into to, uh, regional and even statewide limitations or rules and regulations. You know, like uh, Sandy brings up that in Maryland, uh, the deposits are legally refundable until the contract. So you could have somebody put money down and go through the whole regular role of the online buy it now process. But until they legally sign a contract, they can bounce right out of that equation and you're responsible to refund that money. So there's, there's, there's a lot of complexities like that that can be regionally or, you know, like seismic in California or, you know, truth in lending that varies from state to state. But how do we separate these, these different nuances outside of just these individual case scenarios where when you build it, you have to build it knowing that these occurrences take place? Dennis? So I think a lot of that, Kevin, has to do with part of the business process planning of this, right? Like going back to some of the what we originally talked about, like trying to work out uh, what does this process look like? And, and it does end up being different for so far in our experience for almost every builder that has implemented it to the point where that these rules can be designed specifically for each particular scenario. So, you know, do we want to, you know, if, we, if we're going to say take $500 as a deposit, um, you know, as a reservation on a home, are we going to say that the you know, the person who put that $500 down, do they have three days to come in and sign a contract? And if they don't sign a contract in that three days, then then are we going to refund the deposit? Maybe in some states where you have to be required to, maybe some builders don't want to do that because they don't want to make it outward like too easy to be able to do that. Or maybe we say you have 24 hours to sign a contract, or maybe we say you have seven days. What happens at the end of that time period? Is it automatically reverted to sale? Do we do something different with the buyer? Do they have to reach out to the salesperson to schedule the contract? Or is an email going to go to a salesperson in that community that says, John Doe just reserved lot 12 for $500. You need to call them right now. You know, there's sort of a lot of, all of these processes can be designed uniquely for each builder's business process. What can their salespeople support? What can their OSC support? What can their accounting department be okay with? Because that's an involvement there. You need, that business office needs to be involved in these conversations. Like, how are they going to account for the credit card deposits? Just as Chip said, you know, like, does the state require that you can't use a credit card for earnest money? Are they going to have to flip it out to an ACH at some point? Or are they going to have to refund it later and collect a check? You know, these are things that absolutely have to be conversation. There is not a one size fits all for this. I don't believe, even if there was one set of rules that worked across all 50 states in the U.S., um, you know, not even including Canada in there, but even if there was a one size fits all rule, I don't, it wouldn't be a one, one size fits all builders rule, right? Yeah. So let me have all three of you take off your, you know, gurus of website hats for just two mm -hmm. seconds and follow me in this concept. If I'm a home builder, why can't I just go to Best Buy and buy a all over the counter, a third party program just to knock all this stuff out? I can go buy a drafting program from Best Buy. Why can't I just get this turnkey system to make this whole process easy? And by all means, any of you that want to grab that one, jump all over it. What are you talking about now? You want to- <laughs> I'm talking about a third party turnkeys. I'm a home builder. I'm just frustrated with, you know, I, I'm getting competitive bids from, you know, Builder Designs, from Blue Tangerine, from Neil Interactive, and it's all confusing. And why can't I just have like a, a simple third party plug-in box that just makes it all happen <laughs> have, we, have we have we not clarified there's a lot going on here kevin but that question does come up are there it third does. party programs i mean you got what does it say uh, uh what's the um the oh i'm gonna draw a blank on the name of the thing but uh, where mm -hmm. people 
sell their stuff online. I forget what it's called. Not not uh, eBay, but um, uh, mm, I don't know. Talking about like putting it on Craigslist or no, something? Like or a, no, not like Craigslist. I'm talking about like just a program. Shopify. That's it. Thank you. Shopify. Thank you. Just want a piece of pencil lead. Oh, uh, uh, Etsy. There we go. Lots of good answers in that list. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Shopify is <laughs> the one I'm thinking of. But so is is there a, a Shopify pathway for a home builder? They could just plunk a spec home mm. right on there and get it done. No, I don't think that. I mean, I personally <laughs> don't think that. I think that's kind of funny um, because it. It, I don't think it can exist for one main reason, and that is you've got a tool, unless it has real-time inventory management, meaning two people can't buy the same home, or I clicked it, I bought it, and now somebody else bought it. You got two people buying the same home, or you've got a salesperson in the model home that is showing in that house, or whatever it is. That's why you know the real the, the e-commerce piece, that's easy. Mm -hmm. That part actually is pretty easy. Um, but it's the back office communication, coordination, inventory management. That's what makes this not a out of the box, bolt it on, you're good to go. In, in, in my opinion, I just don't see I, that. I think, I think Dennis hinted at that earlier on when he talked about mm -hmm. the whole one of a kind concept, mm -hmm. right? At, at the end of the day, because there's a land piece that goes and, and there's only one of that piece of land, right? No matter which home you end up or what you put in that home, it's still connect. There's only one of those, like Chip was saying, right? If, if you're selling, you know, something else online, you may not have very many of them to sell, but, but if you happen to get two orders or three orders or whatever, and you only had two left and you say, sorry, I'm out of stock, I'll get more later or whatever. But that one, that's that one lot, that's the only one, you know? And, and so like Chip said, it's gotta be very seamless that what's available, and what's not, or you're going to have very angry people um, that won't be customers anymore. If you, if you mislead them on something like that. Yeah. yeah. And I, I have to say that too, I, on top of all of that, if, if there were the solutions and there's definitely some, some, there's definitely some packaging there that, you know, the, there, there sort of is a turnkey solutions that are sort of being proposed. I, I just caution builders from thinking about that, from that being a long-term solution for them. Um, because ultimately what you're doing is if we're saying that you're, you're really trying to create a seamless process where somebody could complete the purchase inside your sales office or online your sales office, if the process goes online, ultimately, you know, I don't even know what Shopify's percentage is. Um, but I know they take a cut of the total sale as a Shopify, just like any of these other package box systems are going to do. Um, how eager are you going to be able to let somebody just, oh, go ahead and complete it online if you know you're given a cut to the thing that's happening online? You know, you're, you're essentially sort of tying off a path. You're basically saying that, yeah, we do offer this, but we don't really want you to use it. You know, we'd much rather you just come in and purchase online. Right. I think it's a much longer term vision and a better solution for the builder to own the road to purchase. Yeah, um, I, I agree a thousand percent. I, I think that the way that I would explain it is it's kind of like a microsite type mm -hmm. project where mm -hmm. it is custom to you. Um, and it's not something that is going to be done on a Friday afternoon. It's going to take time. It's going to, you know, testing, which we've already kind of gone through that. But I, in your mind, I would say, just kind of prepare for the fact this is very custom. This, this is important. This is selling homes um, and we want to track all the data. That's the other part of this whole thing that we have to keep in mind is that the, the, the opportunity to understand the buyer journey, the buyer behavior, what they mm -hmm. do, how many times they can, all that, that is so important to get that. So you've got to make sure that you have mechanisms to track all that. If you're going to go through the expense to do this, make sure you have that stuff in place because you're missing a huge opportunity if you don't. Along, along those lines mm -hmm. too, the experience of our buyers is one of the key opportunities to differentiate. You talked about commoditization and things there, right? So you, you go to a platform type scenario and at some point you are locked in somewhere. Maybe there's some ability to tweak a little bit, but there will be a point at which you cannot tweak it to be yours. Like, mm -hmm. like was, was being, and it's that, that buyer journey, that buyer experience, which is a part of that differentiation um, beyond the actual product itself. Yeah. 
So do we, do we think that we're do we think that we're looking at providing a pathway to transparency of information? but still controlling the process. Is that really what, what you're kind of driving at? It sounds like I'm getting that from all three of you, really. Tra transparency of information is a huge piece of this, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's critical because people can't make a decision without information. And, and so they, they've got to have, they got to know what they're getting or they're never going to be comfortable pulling the trigger. Yeah. All right, so go, go ahead, Dennis, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, but definitely not, not just relinquishing control of the transaction to rely on something else. It would, it would be as if a builder said, well, we, no one can purchase from us unless there's a co-op agent involved. But no builder would do that, right? That doesn't make sense, but that's essentially what you're doing if you're saying, I don't own or control any part of the online purchase technology. And, and that's essentially, you are, you are forever putting a middleman in between a client's ability to purchase from you. And it just seems like, a, why would you do that? Yeah. Well, applause for the quote of the day, which is the builder mm -hmm. should own the road to purchase. Uh, I'll applaud that. I like that. Yeah, I love that. I love that. <laughs> so, so let's, uh, we're, we're running, get, coming up toward the end here. We need, still need to save a little bit of time to give away some door prizes, but uh, uh, I want to kind of know, and this is from each of you and let's, let's go, let's go backwards this time. We started with uh, Dennis last time. So let's go chip Greg Dennis. And I'd like to know what do you guys all feel the next steps are and and or either the next steps or what you feel a builder needs to get in place before they can even entertain the idea of moving forward with a buy it now function in any capacity. Chip, uh, well, either tangent. Yeah, I think um, the first step is is um, understanding product fit. What kind of what kind of builder are you? Where are you building? What kind of buyers? You know that. Let's start there doesn't mean that it has to be millennials only because, you know, other people are buying these things. Um, we know that people are buying homes online, you know, through this scenario that we talked about. Um, if we know that that's happening and has happened. I can, I, I don't see any reason why that's going to stop. So if we take that as a given, then what does the implementation look like for, for me, for the builder? What do we need to do? What do we need to think about? What are the people that we need to coordinate together so that we get buy-in in all those things? So it, again, it goes back to that comment about a meeting, about a meeting. You need to start by planning, you know, and, and, and testing, plan on testing, and then testing again in a controlled environment where you can run through, put a deposit down, see what happens, make sure that it goes through, that your, you know, the emails get kicked out to the buyer and all, all that stuff has to happen. Um, I just think that we all have to have an open mind to this. Um, is it going to be an industry standard? You know, I don't know. I think it's a tool that's in the toolbox right now that wasn't there before. And I think it's going to continue to gain some steam where it goes from here. You know, we're all right here together, you know, figuring it out. So, um, I think that, yeah, I mean, my, my big advice is, is to plan, develop a plan and then think about, what's in it for the buyer? You know, what's, what problem are we solving for the buyer? We know right now that buyers are frustrated, pricing rates, things like that, competing bids. You know, um, if you can go to the front of the line and say, this house is available, then I'll take it. Let's get started. I think that you're solving a problem for them that, that is, is relevant and, um, you know, is something to consider. Greg. So I think that, Buy online and all of this is is something that there are a few builders that are ready for, and there are a whole lot of builders that if this is step 10, they're still back on step two and three, just in general with their website overall and what they're doing online to start with. I mean, I'm just talking about the, the collateral to explain what your product even is with, with the kind of imagery and tours and interactive you know, floor plans and things like this that they don't, they don't even have to where it's like, you can put a buy now button there, but if I don't know what it is I'm getting, I'm never going to click that, right? You, you've got to give me the information. You've got to get comfortable with the whole transparency of, of not holding back and not blocking their ability to fall in love with your homes, right? And, and be able to say, that's the home I want. I mean, Dennis talked about if it's the right home, it doesn't matter what the process is. They'll go over, you know, mountains to get it, right? Well, convince them it's the right home. Right. I mean, that's that's what we've got to do. And, and we're there's too many builders that aren't doing that well yet, in my opinion, 
that don't have any business even talking about putting a, a transaction in place when you haven't overcome that. But again, I, I totally believe in, in the whole strategy first idea as well. So just, um, you know, so I completely agree that a lot of builders are not quite there yet. It might be racing to the finish line before they've run the middle of the race. But uh, if by chance we've got a builder that's there, that, that is actually ready, my, my, my suggestion for where they would start is to uh, look, at, look at their buying experience now. You know, um, you know, hopefully if they're ready, they have the data in terms of how people sort of experience their website, experience their sales offices, and eventually go into an agreement and, and look for where the ones that don't go into an agreement or even the ones that do look for where uh, velocity suffers. You know, where do things slow down? Where do people get stalled? And then that's where we should look to see what are the opportunities to use some of this technology to keep things moving. Uh, that would be my suggestion. I love it. Well, gentlemen, that was a whole bunch of good stuff. Um, and obviously, if anybody wants to get a hold of any of you, I know all three of you are all on LinkedIn. Um, and then uh, we'll have on the in the meeting notes on the link to this, we'll have your emails as well. So if anybody wants to get a hold of any of you, they can. But for now, let's go ahead and do some fun stuff. Let's give away some prizes. Let's give away oh. a Retro 51 pen. These things are the bee's knees. The first person that types into the chat, the layman's term for what an API is. <laughs> the layman's Ooh. term for an API, type into the chat. The first person that gets it in there is the winner. I'm looking. Yeah. I'm looking Kevin's, Kevin's pulling out the hard questions. It's yeah. a hard question. It's actually yeah. legit. We mentioned it though. Ooh. Translator program, Ooh. Sandy. You're oh. Actually Oh, well, Rachel, Rachel actually gave what it's actually called, application program interface. But the layman's term is a translator program. So, Sandy, you are the winner. So, I will, uh, Tabitha will write that down for me. Um, the second, I don't know. I, I like Rachel, but go ahead. Go ahead. You know what? I like Rachel, Rachel too. Rachel? You know what? Rachel and Sandy, you both win a retro pen. There we go. Done. All right. Now for the whopper. The first person that types in this next answer gets not only a house that she built book with or without my autograph. I didn't do anything with it, but other than I just bought like 40 of them now. And the coloring and activity book. Mm. The first person that types in the three companies' names of the companies that these gentlemen represent in the chat. Mm. The first person that types all three companies wins. Okay, okay, so we're not eligible, right, Kevin? You guys are ineligible now. Right, Kevin. <laughs> And I'll even mention them if, they, if we need to, if I don't see anybody typing fast enough. The spelling matter? Uh, Mary oh. Builder, Designs, no, 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 no. Interactive. You're missing one. No. Oh, oh, there's Mary. one. All right. Mary. Thank you, Mary. I was, I was worried because I know Mary. And Mary, come on, Mary. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> but Mary, you won both of these. Uh, we will get, we'll reach out to you. We'll have your emails, of course. Uh, so we will reach out to all three of you, uh, Rachel. Uh, Sandy and Mary uh, to get you get your mailing addresses so we can send you those prizes. Gentlemen, uh, Dennis O'Neill, Greg Bray, Chip Johnson, thank you very much for your time today. Um, there's so many facets and, and angles that you know builders have to consider when they're looking and, and trudging down this this landmine filled pathway and cost filled pathway. There's tons of cost involved in this too, sure. not just to you know what they pay to have it implemented, but all the subsets and subsystems they have to tie into to make it all compatible. So keep that in mind that uh, there, it is, a, it is a pathway that any one of these three men can help you with um, and get that, get that going for you in whatever capacity you need it in. So gentlemen, thank you very much. And all of our attendees, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks everybody.